Again. <laughs> hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to welcome you all to the last day of the term. We made it to the end of Mikomas. Congratulations, everybody. <laughs> uh, and the last in circle of the term as well, the last in circle of 2022. What a great privilege. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Anne McKenna. I co-direct the Africa Oxford Initiative, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this in Saka. For those joining us from warmer climates across uh, different parts of the world online, warm welcome to you all. Please send us some warm thoughts, and a warm welcome to you all who joined us from various departments in Oxford. Um, for those who are in Saka connoisseurs, you know that this is a special one. This is not our usual in Saka mode. We have a special in Saka today, inviting colleagues from different departments to address one particular issue. Often we have two different speakers discussing different topics, but this time because of the urgency and the importance of this topic, we've got a dedicated in Saka to talk about the climate crisis, to talk about just transitions in the continent. Now, some of us have been following COP faithfully, others are just interested uh, bystanders, others are, and, but every, one of, every single one of us is affected in one way or the other by this conversation. So it's with great honor and, and delight that I'm welcoming our, our speakers for today. Um, and I will start with inviting Dr. Kennedy Mbeba to give us an overview of what the conversation is. And towards the end, I'll talk a little bit for the new people who are joining us about what the Africa Oxford Initiative is and what our job is in the university. And, and hopefully you can stick around for that. Over to you, Kennedy. Um. Thanks a lot, Anne, and uh, thank you everyone uh, for showing up on a Friday um, afternoon. I'm sure you had better things to do, but uh, good to see you all here. I think today we'll be discussing a very important topic uh, of the prospects of the just transition in Africa. And uh, we're very lucky because our Insaka in comes in just a fortnight after the UN climate change negotiations in Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. And uh, it was very interesting uh, this year because <coughs> The climate change negotiations, or the COP, as it's called, or COP27 this year, um, was dubbed an African COP. What does that mean? Uh, we'll find out today, so I might not have the answer. But I think it's quite um, interesting to explore this topic 
and what it means for Africa, but also uh, what it means uh, for the world, uh, looking at it from the African perspective. So without much ado, uh, we're very uh, sort of lucky uh, we have some distinguished speakers with us here today. Uh, as uh, Anne mentioned, uh, it's a little bit of a different kind of insaka where we have one topic, uh, but we uh, have very interesting speakers and uh, we also look forward to a very uh, interesting discussion, if not a vigorous debate uh, on this uh, very important, uh, but very con contested issue. So I'll introduce um, uh, our speakers and then I'll just give a very brief overview of the session. And then uh, from there, we'll, uh, we'll get into it. So we have um, three uh, speakers today. And the first one will be Dr. Jessica Mukuti, uh, who's uh, based here at Oxford. And she's a Net Zero uh, fellow, and she works on uh, Just Transition and, and Net Zero. So uh, Jessica will be giving us an overview of uh, COP27. Uh, what is it exactly? Why is it important? And why are we discussing it here today? So that at least we're all on the same page for those who work on the topic and those who might not work on it, but are quite interested in it. Uh, we'll also have uh, Pamela Levira, uh, who's here with us, and she came all the way from Addis uh, to join us for this conversation. So we're very grateful to, to have you here. And Pamela is a policy officer uh, working on climate change uh, at the African Union Commission. Uh, she's uh, you know, behind the scenes helping our member states to think about how to uh, respond to these uh, very uh, difficult issue, especially for the African continent. And last but not least, we have uh, Pamela Gopal, who's joining us remotely uh, from uh, South Africa. Uh, Pamela <clears throat> could not be able to, uh, to be here with us physically, but we are very happy to have her join in remotely. And uh, Pamela is the head of the policy bridge tank uh, of the African Union Development Agency. And for those who have been following uh, sort of events in the continent, uh, the AUDA, NEPAD, as it's called, uh, was upgraded, uh, I think, just a year or two ago uh, by the heads of state to become the premier development agency in the continent. And uh, the policy bridge tank is a think tank arm of it. And Pamela will be taking us through how in Africa we're thinking about this very difficult uh, policy challenge in a long term perspective. What are some of the challenges, but also what are some of the opportunities in addressing these questions effectively, but in a way that is sustainable. So without much ado, our format today um, is meant to be interactive. So Jessica will give us a quick overview of what COP27 uh, was, what were the main outcomes and why is it important for the continent? And then we go to Pamela who will really give us the gist of what's happening in the continent from the policy perspective. And then Pamela will tell us how we can think about it. Uh, and each of them will have 15 minutes. Uh, that will take us slightly past the half hour mark and then we have almost half an hour of uh, Q and A discussion. So start preparing your questions. Uh, if you're a debater, start preparing uh, to debate. <laughs> I really hope to have a really engaged uh, kind of conversation. So without much ado, Jessica, over to you. Oh, I need to stand there. Sorry. Um, perfect. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jessica, and um, that is my best photo. I took it in 2019. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, Kennedy asked me to give you an overview of what happened at COP. It's really biased because I went there and I think I, um, I remember vividly what I was interested in. And so I'll just focus on what I was interested in, um, which is adaptation finance, um, a bit of mitigation and loss and damage. I think there were other issues emerging on the sidelines, which I'll probably not be able to kind of adequately capture, but you can kind of, um, there's been a few um, other um, Oxford team members who were there. And so, um, like my colleague, um, um, Alexis McGiven, who went there and she can really talk about how, um, um, how youth and activism actually evolved at the COP. Um, and so, um, so I have about three themes. Um, so one is, as I said, on finance and adaptation. Second is on uh, mitigation. And then the third one, which if you're, uh, you've been following the debate is on loss and damage. And so as Ken mentioned, um, the COP was an African COP and this was my second one. And so it's really new um, for me. I went there with an open mind and I came back with um, really impressed um, concerns, but generally impressed with the scale of the activities. And so um, being an African COP, we knew from the very beginning when it was announced that the COP would be going to Africa, we, we kind of sensed that the, it would be focusing on implementation. And the reason for implementation was that um, 
the COP presidency and the, the partners were hoping to highlight the urgency for moving towards implementation and ensuring that the African continent, but also developing countries in general, are able to respond at the scale that is needed to address the, the problem. And so um, we have targets, we have policies across, you know, across the world for um, adapting, mitigating loss and damage for 2030 or even 2050. But the COP was hoping to highlight that we needed to kind of, as a planet, but also for developing countries to quickly transition towards implementation. Um, and so um, one of the things that happened in relation to finance and adaptation was that there were continued discussions on, um, I think ongoing discussions on the goal for adaptation, but also on the goal for finance, which is expected to, um, to, to kind of um, come to peak, I think in the next um, two or three COPs. So by 2025, we should have a revised goal for, for financing. But then um, one of uh, other things that came up was that there were, um, there was a commitment by some countries, but also some institutions, mostly um, non-state institutions to commit additional financing towards the adaptation fund. And so the adaptation fund is one of the, one of the largest, but not the biggest, one of the kind of key international funds that funds adaptation, and it's very important for developing countries. And so we had about 230 million US dollars committed towards the adaptation fund, but also the um, COP led to a decision within the, the main text that um, was, there was an agreement that there would be need for an additional four to six um, trillion of, um, of finance in US dollars per year that would be needed to be, investment, to be invested towards um, renewable energy to achieve net zero or to achieve, uh, to achieve transitions towards net zero or low emissions. And so that's a really key text because um, if it ends up in the main, in the final document, it means that countries have agreed that there's a need for investments. And for those who know how international policy, particularly on environmental governance works, it's a key text is just the beginning. And so there's need to actually follow it up and make sure that you're, you're delivering on that. And then second theme is mitigation. Um, some, the, the overall, Thoughts from those who were at the COP and those who read the final text said that there was really no real progress on mitigation, but the text, um, the final agreement recognized that there is need for urgent and deep emission reductions or emission cuts, but it did not really, um, that, 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 that acknowledgement is not some, it's not different from what we had from the previous COP. And so generally the two weeks, um, the agreement was that, okay, we still need deep and emission uh, deep and urgent emission cuts, although the, there wasn't really an, an discussions on what, you know, whether there would be an increased ambition, whether countries increased the ambition even at the COP, because we've seen previous COPs, um, countries coming and saying that we said we'd do this, but then we're committing towards doing this plus 10% or, or, you know, of that. And so there wasn't really an increase in ambition, there was kind of just an emphasis of what was agreed at the previous COP. Um, and then, um, and then there's also kind of there's the, there was still kind of underlining what was agreed at the US COP in relation to um, fossil fuels. And so the agreement was that the um, countries would still phase down um, coal, which for many is a disappointment because it, can, it represents this, the previous commitment towards, or the previous, um, yeah, the previous commitment towards fossil fuels. And so um, most comments on, on, on the COP says that COP27 is, um, it's kind of still, committed towards fossil fuels. And so there was nothing about oil and gas. There wasn't even like phasing out coal, which was expected to be a kind of a big outcome of a COP discussion following COP26. And then lastly, and the most famous one is loss and damage. And so um, one thing that um, I've, 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 I've studied or been interested in global climate governance for a while, and I know that loss and damage was an issue that was discussed on the fringes, but not really at a COP. And so it never really made it to an agenda of a COP. And so, for the first time at COP27, and mostly because of efforts by very specific groups, particularly developing countries, loss and damage made it to an agenda at the COP. And so countries, parties spent two weeks talking about loss and damage. And one of the great outcomes was that parties agreed to developing a loss and damage fund. Um, and, and that was it. So they said that they develop a loss and damage fund. And by the next COP, which is November of next year, they will come up with a very clear structure for what it is, how it will be financed, and then they'll figure out how to move forward after that. And so we still don't know how that fund will look like, how much money will go into it, who puts money into it, who gets the money, who benefits from it, what actually gets them. Um, you know, what gets funded from that. And so there's a lot of uncertainty. And this is where um, we're really, we're, I, I think for those observing the process are really excited. There's now loss and damage. It's, it's a significant thing because to be honest, there's groups out there that are losing 
um, that are experiencing damages from climate change that are not covered under mitigation or adaptation, but also kind of ex expressing that fear that, you know, just saying that we will do something is, and even not even saying what it is, it's just broadly saying that we will create a fund is quite vague. And from experience, we've seen what happened to the last fund. So the Green Climate Fund was created in 2010 and became operational in 2015. If we assume that we keep at the same pace, if a fund is created in 2020 three, then it becomes operational in 2020, what, five years at the best, you know. So it's kind of that very long term, and then that's, that's stretched out, and we don't know how much money goes into it. There's still a lot of uncertainty, but I kind of, um, I said this yesterday to a group of students that we know that there's a very good group of experts, you know, very high level experts thinking about this. And so what we need to do is to maybe either contribute to those discussions or trust that they will come up with the best solution, particularly for those who are experiencing losses and damages. So generally COP was good, you know, Africa, um, did step forward. It, um, it, it basically demonstrated that it can run a COP that emphasizes or kind of focuses on its priorities, which was adaptation, financing, and loss and damage. But also there's kind of that global, um, that global disappointment kind of saying that we came here and we've left with still a for, you know, emphasis or commitment to fossil fuels. We're still not phasing out coal. We're still kind of, we seem like we're still moving forward with oil and gas. And so it's kind of that this kind of disjointed feelings um, amongst different groups, which I'm not sure if it will be addressed at the, at the next call, but I'm really excited to see what happens. Thank you very much. That was more than five minutes, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. I think next we have uh, Pamela. Yeah, thank you, colleague. Good afternoon, good evening. It's a very great honor and a privilege to stand before you to bring the greetings from the Africa Union Commission and to reflect what we have seen from the COP27 and how it reflects to African politics and the regional politics as well with regard to climate change. As we can see that from the previous uh, discussion from our colleague, the way we see that uh, uh, climate politics is very critical to ensure sustainable development of the African continent and the, uh, the, the, the general discussion in general. So we can say that uh, uh, this Afri African COP has been uh, uh, very successful. At the same time, it has been very challenging because the way we see uh, Africa is going, we can find that uh, uh, we have a numbers of issues that need to be addressed while we are transitioning. Because as African Union, a, a political organization, we really have to ensure that uh, we maintain our development priorities while considering the issues related to climate change. As we can see that from the previous introduction, uh, Africa is considered to be the most young continent and the most uh, impact continent on issues related to climate change. But we have seen a lot of low hanging fruit, which are very critical to ensure that they support a just transition initiative in Africa. Because as we can see from the African perspective, we have a lot of natural resources. We have a lot of potential to drive the, the climate adaptation and mitigation agenda. However, some of the issues has been keeping back the development agenda. You can see an increase in numbers of, of disaster and increase in numbers of, of debts resulting from economic losses from the impact of the climate change. And we can see that uh, uh, the impact is very differential from different areas. So our development is, uh, development is being compromised the, by the climate change. So what we can, we can see that uh, the regional uh, and the global perspective on, on the climate change issues has been transitioning. So the, the issues of transitioning is not new, basically. We can see from early in the 1970s up to the Paris Agreement and NDC, we have seen a numbers of transition agenda and transitional policy to ensure that we have the collective goal to, to keep the temperature to a minimum to ensure that we, we promote lives to the most vulnerable. At the regional level, we have a, a continental agenda that uh, drive development in Africa. We have the Agenda 2063, it's a 50 years vision, which emphasizes the need for an integrated, prosperous, peaceful Africa. And we want to see that our African uh, development are driven by uh, the people of the Africa. But uh, looking at the dynamics of the climate change really 
we can see from the agenda 2063, the issues related to climate change has compromised a lot a development agenda in Africa. So it is, we see that uh, in, in the movement of seeing now, we wanted to leapfrog to ensure that we are moving from the business as usual to low carbon development. We needed to strengthen our policy, our regional policies, our cooperation. We need to see that the issues related to climate change are very strongly, and uh, we put a lot of emphasis to ensure that we enhance environmental sustainability in Africa. So to go into peace with the, the development challenges and the climate agenda, to this year in 2022, the African Union has launched its strategy on climate change, and we name it in Africa Union Climate Change and the Resilience Development Strategy and the Action Plan to guide the continent on various issues pertaining to a low emission and carbon development and ensure that we coordinate uh, at the regional level issues related to climate change. So it has various pillars, as you can see from this presentation, and the strategic areas. So of the most important, I will emphasize two strategic areas, issues related to uh, climate resilience development. There are numbers of areas where we can see transformation is very critical in Africa, for example, in the energy system, uh, in the low carbon and the res resilient urban area. For example, in Africa, we have almost 800 million people. They don't have access to proper uh, cooking facilities or clean energy. So these are the areas that uh, when transitioning, we now have to see that uh, we ensure that those who are most vulnerable are, are, are being compensated when we are, we, are, we are transitioning. And also the issues of, of carbon uh, loss and damage, we put it into our climate change strategy. And we are very grateful to see that uh, this couple has uh, taken note of this issue, even though there are a numbers of issues that will need to be emphasized. And it, we are imperative, very uh, grateful to see some of the developed country have started to pledge for loss and damage. I think Sweden and some of the other country will join to, to see that uh, we, we, we compensate on that uh, historical uh, a carbon emission to ensure that those adaptation issues that can be cannot be saved by naturally being compensated and the other other issues. So we can see this this COP uh, COP, uh, COP, uh, COP 27 and African COP have recognized the issues for trust transition and they, they mentioned in the final text that uh, there is a need to ensure that uh, the just transition is very inclusive and in minimizing the negative social and the economic impact that may arise from the climate action. So while we are transitioning to low carbon de development, while we are transitioning to, to net zero, we have to ensure that the most vulnerable community are, are, are not impacted by the action of transition. As you can see, Africa, we have a lot of gap in terms of uh, finance, as a uh, previous speaker mentioned. Currently, the, the, the flow of climate finance stands to, to about 30 billion US dollar. And we need to mobilize at least three forty-seven billion billion uh, annually to ensure that we, we enhance adaptation and mitigation in, in Africa. So in summary, I see that uh, for Africa to, to transition uh, smoothly, there are numbers of issues that they need to be emphasized. First, we have low hanging fruits that we see can capitalize the potential of Africa to transition. We, we have a, a political will in Africa. Most of the member states have agreed to put a strategy in place. This is very commendable, our member states. And also we have our skills and indigenous knowledge. We need to use them to, in order to ensure that we're transitioning. And then you have people. Africa is a very youngest continent and it's growing. We have talented youth, we have talented, uh, we have natural resources. We need to capitalize our, our resources to ensure that we, we transition in properly. And also there are issues of policy reforms because you can see some of the government uh, you, uh, depend on, on import for revenue. So once we stop uh, importing those, uh, uh, some of the activities that uh, pollute, who is going to compensate on issues related to resources. So we need to do a numbers of policy reform to ensure that uh, 
we enhance just transition in Africa. And also the issues of, of uh, advocacy, including strengthening the narrative of Africa to ensure that uh, issues related to finance and adaptation are well articulated, national adaptation plans are well articulated because without uh, national adaptation plans, it's, it's very difficult to mobilize resources because it gives the direction of individual country what you want to. And also funding issues related to technology and uh, utilizing uh, uh, resources, including energy mix as we are moving to low carbon development. Some of the development agenda has to be funded by a mix of energy. So this is very critical, including the capitalize the, the issues of uh, gender, uh, the issues of women, cooperate the issue of women is very critical in, in this regard. So I see from this uh, perspective, uh, I will share the Africa Union Climate Change Strategy, maybe through Kennedy, so you can have a look at it and interact with it and see where are the areas that uh, we can make some intervention and, and suggest and, and see how we can move forward. So with this regard, I'm stopping here. Thank you very much. So uh, Pamela, mm -hmm. I think we have Pamela who's joining mm -hmm. us remotely. So uh, if you can hear us, uh, Pamela, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And hello, everyone. Hi, thanks, Kennedy. Um, hi, my name is Pamela um, Skopo. And I represent the African Union Development Agency. I lead on the, as Kennedy said, on the program called the Policy Bridge Tank. And I extend my warm greetings specifically to Professor Kevin Marsh, uh, Dr. Anne McKenna, and the entire team at the Oxford, um, Africa Oxford Initiative, specifically Adelina, David, and Chimwemwe. Thank you very much for all your support. I also want to uh, say, extend a special thank you to and gratitude to Professor Thomas Hell and um, uh, Dr. Kennedy, uh, who, who, has, who has made this opportunity possible. And I sincere greetings to all of you students and staff uh, or visitors of Oxford University. I'm, I'm really sorry that I couldn't join you physically. And Pamela, I'm very sorry to leave you standing alone, but my sincere greetings uh, to you all from warm South Africa. So uh, before I just dive in, uh, a bit of hi historical context. I think it's uh, important to just provide that on Africa's decision and the institution that I represent. Uh, Kennedy was not sure when we became the African Union Development Agency, so I'll clear that uh, doubt out. So this happened in uh, September 2018. Uh, when the African Union Assembly approved the establishment of the African Union. And this had uh, started uh, through the reform uh, process of the African Union, which was led at the time by President Paul Kigami. And he, uh, you know, it was, and it was affirmed by also the member states that a NAFAD agency be transformed into uh, the African Union Development Agency as the union's or the continent's own instrument to a champion support to countries and regional bodies in advancing the implementation of the continent's development agenda 2063. And in particular today, I think I want to just zone in because of the program that I represent, the one key mandate, and that is to provide advanced knowledge-based advisory support to our member states and regional bodies. To do that, we need to, I think, rethink the development trajectory that we are in and uh, the future of African development and partnership gender. I think uh, focusing on major uh, uh, categories of uh, development, such as you know, education, which we, we all know about, where all our children should be in school with adequate resources, um, our health systems, there should be sufficient clinics and hospitals with uh, requisite workers for all of them. Uh, electricity should be accessible to everybody in the continent. And farming and agriculture and agri agriculture should actually be seen as a food exporter to the rest of the world and not uh, specifically the other way around. So the other important aspect when we think about re uh, rethinking development is infrastructure. And infrastructure you know, is basic uh, infrastructure, including roads and, and how urban infrastructure needs to uh, be in place as Africa is quickly becoming urbanized. And of course, um, the other important thing is the digital connectivity, 
because we have uh, we see the benefits in developed countries from developing countries and the cost of, of digital connectivity should be um, prohibited you know it shouldn't be um, a, a constraint for governments to provide this to its citizens so with this africa's self sustainability will only be feasible if proper values are given to its resources and adequate support is provided this means new ways of accessing development finance and uh, reassessing relationships with development and international partners are, are crucial. And in order to think about this development differently, we had to ask ourselves as a, a question, what does it mean as a development agency to transform the, uh, you know, the continent? And uh, we appreciate the need for transfer transformation requires collaboration in an all encompassing way. Although uh, COVID has taught us that we can never be ready in, in all aspects. However, it has also taught us uh, how quickly uh, we ha have the ability to learn and adapt to these changes and challenges that we are faced. So COVID, yes, it exposed us to the critical structural uh, development weaknesses that we have and fragilities and also exposed to the African development systems where businesses uh, could not continue as usual and as a continent, we regressed on the implementation of our national development plans and uh, Agenda 2063. But after 50 years of, uh, after the end of co uh, colonialism, uh, were marked by the development challenges and opportunities with human capabilities. And that is, you know, providing, um, improving our economies, expanding their government, governance institutions and consolidating. But we had to quickly see this shift after COVID, saving lives to saving lives and livelihoods. And we had, you know, compelling cases where the uh, health issues now became a much more socioeconomic issue. Medium term, we had our countries had to offer economic uh, stimulate, uh, stimulus measures. And in the, in the medium term, and in the medium term, we had to do adjustments in development strategies and our policies and our budgets. Uh, the next few years for development, uh, the push from now till 2063, it will be characterized by the choices uh, it may, we make versus the policies uh, that we set. And Africa's transformation will will even will be will require an even more drastic change. I think um, so. Together, what what we have done as the NEPAD agency, uh, together with Party um, Center for the party study a center at the university, uh, Denver University, we undertook a foresight study uh, to provide member states with an analytical evidence-based tool and knowledge to make informed uh, development uh, investment choices and adjustments. Um, and, and what we came up with is that there was four key um, uh, transition uh, that, that needed to be focused on. And that one was the demographic, where at least 30% of our global population will be African, and we know this by the year 2063, but coupled with infrastructure development, massive increase in urbanization uh, population that I spoke about, uh, we need to address that. The, the second one is uh, human development and inequality transformation. We will witness an increased life expectancy, uh, decreased demand uh, for higher education and um, sorry, not decrease, an increased demand for higher education and improvements in the GDP per capita. Uh, the other aspect of importance would be technology and high levels of penetration of ICT will characterize Africa's econo econo economic and social um, uh, landscape. And then the last one, which we are in the room about, is the environmental aspect where uh, natural system depletion will lead to acute uh, environmental stress in terms of global climate change and how it will impact African, uh, Africa's development uh, with increasing forces. We, we very well know that uh, Africa is the least emitting continent. It's only co responsible for about 3% of global emissions and with nearly 20% of the world's population. And this includes some of the most uh, vulnerable countries. And yet the continent is losing between about five to 15% of GDP growth to climate change. Uh, annually, and action needs to be taken to close the, the three a trillion US dollar climate financing gap. And I'm glad to, to know the focus of the, the, the speaker who spoke first on, on the financing aspect of um, the, the COP27. 
to 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 speak now on the on the forward push towards the future, and and following from the the four major transformations that I spoke about um, that's already taking place at the continental level, each transformation will present us with challenges as well as opportunities, and therefore it brings us to the policy bridge tank that I that I, I lead on. Uh, where we have decided that growing our, our knowledge base through learning and sharing is fundamental to approach development, not only in an inclusive manner, but in a, an innovative manner. So setting bold uh, leadership for the agency requires learning. Um, it requires a reiterative experimentation, which includes non-traditional approaches of thought partnership. So we need to create opportunities for African government officials to participate in innovation and research within, uh, with African um, scientists, with academia, with graduates like yourself to produce tangible commercial deliverables to implement on the ground. And this, uh, of course, followed by the technological transfers, the intellectual property uh, rights uh, that we, we have and uh, or we, we should set in place. And we aim to do this through a program called Energize Africa, which I mentioned to some of the MPP students yesterday in our pursuit to attaining the Agenda 2063 goals. And at the Policy Bridge Tank, we also understand that we must approach regional integration through investment of exceptional human capital skills. And an integrated Africa requires this exceptional skills, the labor force towards um, our preparedness to implement the uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. So therefore, uh, we are positioning uh, support by the um, African Union Development Agency for entrepreneurial support and research excellence in, in this program, Energize Africa. So what are Africa's critical choices? And here we, we have global uncertainties versus African uncertainties. And, and to address governance versus the power, it will really require our leaders who want to succeed to get out of their comfort zones. And um, if we take the example of Botswana and the Central African Republic, there were two states that are, are similar in many ways, uh, had the similar position 50 years ago with a GDP of $400 US dollars per capita. But today Botswana has multiplied its GDP per capita by 20 and Central African Republic has divided itself by two. What is the main factor? And the main factor here is institutional equality and, and good governance. And institutions, whether of governance or, or coordinated governance, are not created for, for a once and for all, but it should rather be a take um, a form of uh, continuous processes for either uh, institutionalization or even deinstitutionalization, and, and such that aspects of policy making uh, has a more coordinated governance approach. Um, coming back to uh, you know carbon emissions, there is no single pathway to uh, net zero carbon emissions without an increase in in in, in the participation of institutional uh, capital at scale uh, that can be deployed at speed. That especially in Africa and emerging uh, markets, climate change is the, one of the greatest investment opportunities of our generation, and that's why I said at the beginning, development should be looked at in an investment eye. And, and, and for this, the African Union Development Agency is in, uh, engaging with innovative uh, investor leader, uh, lead um, private capital mobilization initiatives. And at COP, I cannot comment whether uh, our expectations were met or not, but um, uh, you know, since these processes are, are of this magnitude can only be reached in incremental steps over time. However, uh, the African Green uh, Investment uh, uh, sorry, Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, the African investor with the COP27 Institutional Investor Consultative um, uh, Coordination Committee, the African Union and the African Union uh, Development Agency, NEPAD, had launched a Just Transition Investors Alliance. And this is an investor-led um, platform for green technology and energy customers um, seeking um, um, to produce finished green goods for Africa's just transition green econ economic zones. And this is predominantly using um, places or locations that are dependent on mining and highly carbon intensive industries. 
So the event at COP showcased an array of innovation institutional investor public uh, partnerships that are bankable and that demonstrated that the just transition investment models uh, can help speed up the, the resources that needs to be mobilized to, to bridge the gap of the three trillion um, uh, US dollars uh, of the nationally determined contributions uh, that need to be raised in, in, uh, for this green infrastructure investment asset seeking uh, capital. And what needs to be done then, uh, you know, to, we, yes, we have launched the, this, but we understand that what needs to be done is to design our policy recommendations and procurement network to assist governments and uh, development partners and policymakers to make informed uh, strategic policy and programmatic de decisions around the, the energy transition sustainable procurement. Um, and, and I'm actually happy to share more, and I will share more through Kennedy on this, uh, some material that we have and some literature on, on the Just Transition Initiative. So um, mo moving uh, towards the future, you know, we have, um, and this is, I think, the last point now, uh, we have elites, um, economists through various schools of thought, and we have leadership. And I would look, uh, you know, I would like to, to say that how would you as students envisage your role in shaping Africa's future development? And I would say that, you know, specifically, uh, we see you as enablers for scientific knowledge. We see you as enablers to supply and drive innovation and entrepreneurship among uh, our member states to strengthen these goals of Agenda 2063. And, and you can help develop tangible commercial deliverables uh, to be implemented on the ground. And also, you know, uh, you, you are, can facilitate this in an enabling environment for technology transfer and intellectual property from um, innovative discoveries that we, we see, uh, you know, all these success stories and we hear success stories around Africa on, on, on the amazing innovation that the, um, the youth can, can um, produce. So you as our young leaders can also help facilitate a two-speed society. And, and, we, and we must involve thinking in terms of transitions uh, to turn the uh, scramble of Africa to, to its advantage and deliver in a prosperous and a sustainable outcome uh, for us all. So I think with that, I will leave it at that and, and I look forward to engaging and, and hearing from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Uh, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Pamela, for rounding off a very interesting set of presentations. And uh, as we open up now the session for q and I'd ask our presenters to just pull their seats uh, and then we can just have a makeshift uh, panel here. And as we do so, um, I think I'll start taking questions. So please uh, state your name as you take your questions, uh, but also uh, sort of keep your question very short. Uh, we have a few minutes and I'm sure there are many questions. And uh, we've, seen, we've all seen there's a party going on uh, at the forum and it starts at 6.30. So if you go beyond 6.30, I'm sure we lose everyone to the party. So, <laughs> so try to grab your attention uh, as much as we can before, before then. And um, since we're having a hybrid session, so we'll open up with a first question online and then we'll take a round of questions uh, and then we we'll see where we get to. So the first question is from uh, Professor Kevin Marsh, uh, who's asked it through YouTube. And the question is, are there any ballpark estimates uh, for the bill for loss and damage across Africa? Because we've talked about uh, there being a loss and damage facility that has been uh, launched uh, at COP27 and uh, Africa is really suffering from the impact. So do we have an idea of uh, how that squares uh, with uh, African priorities? Uh, so we'll take questions from the room. Uh, Anyone with questions? Just your name and then the question. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Muhammad. Uh, you have discussed how to mitigate the, the impact of uh, environmental change and uh, how to prevent that. But uh, I want to ask you uh, in relation with displacement, right? Like uh, the climate change has been causing displacement in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, I wonder, like, were there any discussion in uh, COP27 in Sherman Shack about how to address and uh, what kind of policy framework as Africa we need to respond to people displaced by climate change? 
Thank you. Any other questions? Great. As you prepare, you, oh, we have a question. <coughs> So I think the first question will go to uh, Pamela. That's from Kevin on, on the estimates. And the second question will go to Jessica. So how do we decolonize the concept of a just transition? What's your name, sorry? Shadrach. Shadrach. So I'll leave that question open to the panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we start with those uh, three questions. So. Uh, uh, Pamela, uh, Pamela, you can uh, get us going, and then Jessica, and then uh, Pamela, you can weigh in, and then for the question of decolonization, uh, any of the panelists, uh, feel free to take it up. For all of you. Thank you for the question. With regard to the the bill or a study uh, to fund uh, loss and damage, as you have been aware that. Uh, Loss and damage is not a, con a, a new concept. It's about discussing how we can solve the issues of unmitigated uh, adaptation, uh, impact of the climate change. Because not we, the, in adaptation, there are limitations. We cannot adapt all the impact. So for example, if, for example, a society has lost its uh, biodiversity at all. How are you going to compensate the, to adapt on that or something that has already disappeared? Mm -hmm. There are limiting ad adaptation and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the so society uh, well, welfare, for example. Mm -hmm. Issues of drought, increased desertifications, a loss of lives. You cannot adapt to loss of lives. If a life has gone, it has gone. So according to the estimate, Africa need at least 2.7 trillion US dollar by 2030 to adapt to the impact of climate change. So it depends on the narrative. There are numbers of figures that has been estimated, but you can see a flow of climate finance in Africa is around 30 billion US dollar per year. So we can see the, the, the gap we, we are looking for and, the, and the, I think this is a very good estimate to start with on how to, to see the, the picture. And the other issue I see, most of the vulnerability in Africa are underestimated. So we can see there are a numbers of unknown vulnerability that need further research in order to properly being a, a Quoted and, 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 and priced. So this is an area to, to see the policy gap, to understand it, research, to study more vulnerability so that we can see the real uh, budget for the impact of and uh, how we can fund loss and damage. Thank you very much. In the spirit of our ancestors, I will cover Pamela's question <laughs> and then answer it. And then get Mohammed's um, question. Um, so I, I think the question of what exactly is the value for loss and damage finance, what, what, what should be countries be looking to mobilize according to third hand information from the COP? It's a question that developed countries asked during one of the negotiations. Um, and the response from a lot of the members within that room um, was that there's studies, you know, we there's a lot of studies that are out there that will give you a kind of a range of estimates on what the cost for loss and damage, particularly in, on the continent. There's regional, global, sectoral, and so all that. And so there's research out there. A lot of it is quite robust. It's based on different approaches, but then there's, you can kind of, you put it together. If you're doing statistics, you can kind of see it clustering somewhere. Um, I, I think over the next maybe 12 or so months, we'll see people start doing systematic reviews or some literature reviews to kind of give you an idea of the range of it or to kind of start identifying what the target for the fund should be. And, and I'm really excited to see what that comes out. And that was definitely not an answer to um, Kevin's question. Um, but it's kind of, yeah, just a general idea. Mohammed, an answer to your question is I have no idea. Um, I, I don't know whether there were discussions on um, on 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 you know uh, displacement and climate change, but I definitely believe that 
all discussions on adaptation, um, on loss and damage, but also on, um, on the global stock take were informed by um, all that we know about the effects of climate change on, um, on displacement, on migration, but also on um, overall well-being of, of, of communities and countries. And so um, I, I, then that's, answer, that's an answer because I was probably not in those spaces, but I know that the global stock take at the moment is incorporating some of that evidence, but also starts thinking about how do we, how, how do we define future action to take into, um, to take into consideration some of these, um, some of these efforts. And I've represented my ancestors, haven't I? <laughs> well, we'll have to ask them. <laughs> uh, so I think I uh, will move next to you, uh, Pamela, and I think we'll throw you the very hot potato of how do we decolonize the, uh, the narrative on, on the just transition? I mean, to be honest, I don't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, it's, it's a tall one, but I think, uh, you know, our, our public policy spaces needs to really um, impact highly uh, in, interdependent, uh, needs to be highly interdependent across sectors, I think. And our interests and our priorities also have to be aligned. It, it is really, um, you know, not something that just can be answered in terms of of, of um, decolonization. We we still prove to be highly um, dependent, but I think as Africa opens up and um, you know create the spaces for for interdependency among itself, we I believe have have sufficient resources to tackle. Um, uh, you know this, this, uh, the just transition deliverables, and as I uh, as I alluded to earlier, um, this just transition uh, alliance that has been launched on the margins of COP uh, aims to mobilize a lot of resources um, to fill this financing gap, and it's hoped that 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 approach, if all um, goes according to as the pledges were, will address that in in a fundamental way. So I hope I hope that answered you uh, as best as I can. Thank you. Great. Uh, so uh, we'll take another round of questions. Uh, See now the debate is warming up. Hi, I'm Doris Okenwa. I just wonder if any of the panelists might have some critical thoughts around COP itself because we've taken it as a given. Um, I don't want to be reductionist to talk about affirmativities and all, but um, Jess, you mentioned how there was no conclusion, but COP has always suffered from ambiguous conclusions. You know, nothing, nothing <laughs> ever really gets decided. So um, it's also about work that goes on behind, you know, the success of COP is, you know, the negotiations and also how much um, regional cooperation and negotiations and planning. I mean, you don't go to COP without, uh, you know, without cooperation, without plans, without a position. And Africa often trips up at that point, even though we are celebrating um, an African COP. So I don't know if you could give us some critical reflections on the event itself, whether we should keep having these things. Um, what you think from your observation, um, you participated this time around, what you think the, the uses are, and some critical reflections and the, the challenges, and then what went on behind the scenes and how, how much cooperation goes on regionally, just beyond the, the performance of it. Great. So I have a good question on unpacking the black box of negotiations. Yes, please. Hello. Oh, yeah. that's my bad. <laughs> Sorry, Ron. Uh, my name is Ben. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I wanted to ask a little bit about the uh, the loss and damages clause that came out in COP. Um, a big debate that maybe was a bit more on the sidelines was the question as to whether or not this loss and damages idea was brought up by countries unaffected by unaffected by climate issues because they wanted to externalize the issues and keep them within the countries that were affected. And so there's this idea that the motive behind it was that by putting money aside in this fund, 
it would prevent issues like immigration from spilling over. Uh, I wondered to what extent that motivation was the case or if there were any other motivations that you felt were behind it that were maybe less than genuine. Thanks. My name is Msizi. And I think my question is at COP um, is a, a multi policy conference. And I appreciate that it's a big driver for the conversations that I had globally. But um, I wanted to understand how does these, do these meetings translate to actual impact on the ground? And also more beyond that, do people really understand what it means for them? and how it impacts them in the long run. Um, and, and another question is around the financing of, I mean, there's a lot of talk around the numbers, but it's also a very social um, issue. And I don't know if there's an inclination to say, how do we move, how are there targets that are specific to the social impact over and above just how much funding is, should be allocated towards this? Thank you. And I think we have uh, two questions from online. Uh, one is from Julius, uh, who asks, is there a role for nuclear energy or nuclear power generation in the continent, especially given the debates on uh, those who are pushing to, you know, uh, not to invest in fossil fuels? So is nuclear an alternative? And a final question from William, uh, which is how can, uh, what are the best ways for researchers to plug into the process? Is there space for research and how we think about these things? So these are numerous questions, but we have two minutes to go. So here's where now I'll use my discretion as chair and ask the panelists not to answer each and every question, but to give us a one minute synthesis of all the questions. How would you synthesize? And what is the one thing that we should take home from uh, those questions uh, when you synthesize them? So uh, I think we'll start with um, one minute uh, response. Uh, we'll start with uh, Jessica and then we go to Pamela and then Pamela will wrap up, uh, wrap up for us before the party starts in the next uh, two minutes, otherwise we won't be yet, uh, able to hear anything. So mm -hmm. over to you, Jessica. Um, yeah, so question on COP, Doris, is there's, a, I feel the same. I, I keep asking myself whether the, the, you know, the, the, the conference itself is still fit for purpose. But I also think that I'm probably not the most, the, the biggest genius. I think a lot of people have thought the same. <laughs> and, and that's probably the reason why we've seen shifts in how the COP is conducted. I mean, We've, I've, I've read work that says that initially there was like probably um, exaggeration, like two Africans attending the COP, and now there's a larger, um, there's a larger delegation. It said that you know there was a lot of inequalities at the beginning, and now there's there's kind of there's work to make sure that these processes are equitable. And so I think it's kind of uh, I, I I still don't know if the event itself or the the platform itself is fit for purpose. But I've spoken to some experts who say that the COP is the one place where countries can come and talk on equal footing, although it's not really equal. But um, it says that it's it's kind of that. And there's also a lot of processes that go into that, which kind of ensures that um, a lot of the decisions are evidence-based. And so it's kind of balancing between politics and evidence. And so I, I don't know, but I think it's kind of the 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 uneasiness that you are experiencing that you're expressing but also the one that I expressed the twice the two times that I've gone to the COP um, that kind of is useful for shaping how this process looks like because most of us in this room will be running the COPs in a few years and so you can get there and you're like when I first started this you know it looked like this and I wasn't happy about it or I liked this and I hated this and so we can continue shaping it or find something alternative to that I'll probably stop there Thank you, Jessica, for your one minute. Uh, <laughs> Pamela, over to you for your one minute of fame. Thank you, thank you. I, I still ask myself 27 corps later, what was achieved. So I do agree. I do agree that we really need to um, rethink how we address these, um, these platforms. And um, I, I really think that um, maybe we can be more construct, constructive by not just gathering. And most of these multilateral engagements sort of have, if you have to ask about the cost benefits, you know, on, on these platforms, I think very little. I think we should re-inject some of this and redirect some of the um, logistics that go into having these big uh, engagements to some of the outcomes, uh, to addressing some of these outcomes financially. So that's what I feel personally, strongly. A research question regarding how does research um, fit into this? I think it is really important. I'm advocating for that and for 
our African um, member states to actually utilize research more and more for their planning budgeting. And I think um, going back to the question that the gentleman asked earlier, uh, decolonizing uh, just transition, I think uh, we need a mandate to access the global markets uh, for finished goods and, and for green technologies in Africa also, um, and manufactured uh, goods, especially from these mining towns that I spoke about earlier, for employing women and youth. So yes, to answer your question, uh, research is very important and these avenues need to be explored. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, that was very uh, succinct. And I think you really touched on the key sort of elements and the question that we all ponder 27 cops later. Should we even keep uh, sort of attending as we've asked, you know, is it worth it? Um, so Pamela, over to you uh, to give us the final word on the matter uh, in today's session. Thank you, Kennedy. For Africa perspective, I see we have a lot of concern with regard to the, uh, the impact of climate change to the development agenda, especially the agenda 2063. So we see that uh, we need a lot of policy reform, regional policy reform, to ensure that Africa is not compromised by the impact of climate change. And we need uh, equitable consultations to ensure that those who are most vulnerable, their needs has to be addressed, has to be on the table, has to be understood. So I think policy research is very critical in this regard to ensure that uh, the Africa needs, the Africa special circumstances, the issues of unmitigated and adapted impact of climate change are accounted for when we are moving to the just transition agenda. So I see that all the issues that have been addressed are very critical. A COP is a platform where we sit together, we identify issues and we find a sustainable solution together because under the Paris Agreement, we say this is a global challenges. We have to work together to ensure that we, come, we form common ground and the, we make this uh, the world a better place for everybody. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pamela, yeah. for that conclusion. I think uh, we should give our panelists a warm round of applause for a very interesting discussion. Great. Uh, so I think as we conclude, uh, you'll, you'll tell by now that this is only the beginning of a conversation. Uh, it's not the end. And uh, we have several opportunities to keep this uh, conversation going. So. Um, we are aware there are many parties going on today. <laughs> so we really thought hard about how do we keep people uh, engaged. Um, but I'll give you an, yes. So uh, I think as Ann, uh, before Anne closes, um, and then gives us a, a couple of announcements. Uh, I think I'll first of all, I have to thank uh, Professor Kevin Marsh, uh, being uh, Dr. Anne McKenna here uh, for really supporting this initiative. So this happened because we're really supportive of it. And we also like to thank uh, David, uh, who's here, Adelina, uh, who's, is Adelina here? No, who's not here, and Chimwemwe as well for really working so hard behind the scenes to make it all come together. So this is all because of them. So round of applause to them. Go back to you, Anne, for some nice surprises. We're only beginning. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Friday, so it's end of term. We're gonna have parties after parties. Please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers and our moderators. beginning it's it's wonderful the spirit of insaka is to have conversations like you would have under the tree and, and tease out things that matter to you and we are grateful that this is a high note to end our, our year and we hope that you will join us for the future in Sakas. if you haven't encountered AFOX before the africa oxford initiative brings together all of africa's interest across the university we have engaging conversations around issues that matter to the continent and we've got a lot of programs for students, for researchers, and for innovators that are focusing on work that advances the development of the continent. So please go to our website, join our mailing list, learn more about the work that we do, and participate as, as much as you can. Um, having said that, at the end of this, we're having a reception outside. Esther, what's the name of the room? You know the room? Yeah, right outside where we're having the drinks, uh, the, the concert place, you will see a drinks reception set up there. Please enjoy a glass of wine or some water or whatever, you know, floats your boat. Um, as it were, please join us at the end. We also have dinner reservations at Lulu. Lula's. Lula's, Lula's Ethiopian restaurant just opposite the side business school. So if you're free, do join us for a wonderful conversation and wonderfully generous. Um, and we really do look forward to welcoming you all for our next Insaka. And uh, it's 
awkward to say this, but happy Christmas, happy holidays, <laughs> and we'll see you in the next next academic term. Thank you, everyone. Have a good, wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, yeah. Dinner from seven. Drinks until then. Have fun. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>